Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Our top story, an over 6,000 percent spike in illegal Chinese crossings at the border compared to just three years ago. How the influx in, is impacting the immigration crisis and even U.S. military facilities in Guam. The Communist Chinese Party has made it known that Guam is a target. Well, Speaker Mike Johnson putting out a series of foreign aid bills alongside one targeting TikTok. Will the proposals be more likely to pass with President Biden's support? How does U.S. foreign policy on Ukraine impact American banking and investments in China? J.P. Morgan CEO weighs in. And China claiming GDP growth of more than 5 percent so far this year compared to last. But calculations are casting doubt on that figure. New numbers are in and the border crisis is getting worse. Illegal Chinese crossings at the border are seeing an over 6,000 percent spike compared to three years ago. Let's take a closer look. Six months into fiscal year 2024, over 24,000 Chinese nationals have entered the U.S. illegally. That number already exceeds all of fiscal year 2023. These numbers just represent those that entered illegally between ports of entry. Taking into account those that did enter through ports of entry, there have been over 40,000 encounters. The spike in illegal Chinese crossings is raising concerns on Capitol Hill. Most of these illegal immigrants are military-age adult men. And lawmakers are concerned that they could act as spies for Beijing. Just last month, a Chinese national was taken into custody after breaching a military base in California. And it's not just the southern border. The small island of Guam in the Pacific is also seeing a surge of Chinese citizens entering illegally, just under 120 since 2022. Some of them are from Saipan, an island just a boat right away from Guam. It's part of U.S. territory where Chinese nationals can come without a visa. NTD's D.C. Bureau Chief Steve Lance spoke with Congressman James Moylan of Guam about the issue. We know the Communist Chinese Party has named a missile after Guam, the Guam killer they call it. Guam has a huge military presence. It's home to a U.S. naval base, an Air Force base, and a U.S. Coast Guard facility. The Communist Chinese Party has made it known that Guam is a target. If we're having illegal Chinese migrants come into Guam, that's a great concern for mine, and this needs to be stopped. Over at the southern border, the problems go beyond illegal Chinese crossings to fentanyl. A new report from the House says Beijing has been subsidizing companies that export fentanyl materials. On average, fentanyl kills over 200 Americans a day. Most of the precursors of fentanyl come from China. They're then pressed into pills in Mexico and trafficked into the U.S. The House could vote on a set of bills to provide foreign aid and potentially ban TikTok as soon as Saturday. They stand a good chance of passing now that two powerful and unexpected allies are uniting behind them. House Speaker Mike Johnson is likely to get the Democratic votes he needs for his new aid package. President Biden is now throwing his support behind the set of bills. They provide a total of about $95 billion for Ukraine, Israel and the Indo-Pacific, according to the House Appropriations Committee. Johnson says he wants to pass a potential ban on TikTok at the same time. That would keep the platform out of U.S. app stores unless it cuts ties with its Chinese parent company. Some Republican hardliners are trying to remove Johnson from his leadership role. Others say the push isn't gaining momentum. An empty speakership is what effectively paralyzed the chamber for weeks after former Representative Kevin McCarthy lost the gavel. Next, a closer look at House Speaker Mike Johnson's plan to tie foreign aid to a package with several foreign policy proposals, including one that could mean saying goodbye to the video app TikTok if its China-based owner doesn't sell its stake. NTD's Jack Bradley has the details. The House is set to vote on an aid package that would require TikTok to divest from its Chinese parent company or be banned from U.S. app stores. Now it's being bundled with Ukraine and Israel aid that's set to clear the chamber this week. 
In a post on X Wednesday night, TikTok said, quote, it is unfortunate that the House of Representatives is using the cover of important foreign and humanitarian assistance to once again jam through a ban bill that would trample the free speech of 170 million Americans, devastate 7 million businesses, and shutter a platform. An earlier version of the TikTok bill had already cleared the House last month. President Biden has promised to sign the bill if it reaches his desk. This comes amid TikTok's intense lobbying of lawmakers on Capitol Hill and its 170 million users in the U.S. to push back against this bill. TikTok is under scrutiny because Chinese law requires TikTok and other companies based in China to hand over user data to the regime, allowing ready access to Americans' personal information by the Chinese Communist Party. The current version of the bill would give ByteDance about a year to sell TikTok or face the ban. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Mexico is reportedly keeping Chinese automakers at arm's length. Reuters cites three unnamed Mexican officials who said pressure from the U.S. is having an effect. The last meeting between top Mexican officials and a Chinese automaker reportedly happened in January. At the meeting, Mexico declined to offer the same incentives that they've awarded to automakers in the past and said they won't meet with other Chinese automakers anytime soon. About 20 Chinese automakers now sell cars in Mexico, but none of them have plants in the country. Chinese vehicles constitute about a third of the total brand offerings in Mexico. The U.S. government pressure reflects fears that Chinese automakers aim to use Mexico as a backdoor to sell cheap electric cars in the United States without paying tariffs. A White House spokesperson recently said President Biden won't let Chinese automakers flood the market with vehicles that pose a threat to national security. The U.S. is warning China not to help Russia with its war in Ukraine. The State Department said it believes Beijing is assisting Moscow in ramping up its defense production. Specifically, the PRC is providing Russia with significant quantities of machine tools, uh, microelectronics, optics, UAVs, and cruise missile technology, and nitrocellulose, which Russia uses to make propellants for weapons. PRC stands for People's Republic of China, the country's formal name. The spokesperson added that Moscow has suffered significant setbacks due to sanctions from the West. Yet Beijing's support is enabling Russia to continue its war in Ukraine. He said the tools and technology from China are filling critical gaps in Russia's defense industrial base. The warning comes as foreign ministers from G7 countries meet in Italy to pledge their support for Ukraine. G7 countries are home to some of the world's richest economies, including the U.S., U.K., Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to visit China next week. He's expected to raise the issue of China's support for Russia during his trip. The U.S. has already spoken with Chinese diplomats and sanctioned relevant firms in China. The Committee on Oversight and Accountability just held the first of what will be several hearings on the Chinese Communist Party's influence in America. We tap one of the witnesses, General Robert Spaulding, for insight. He's a retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General and author of War Without Rules. General Spaulding, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks. Great to be back. Now, we often hear this term political warfare when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. You were actually just testifying on Capitol Hill about that recently. Help us understand what exactly is political warfare, the way communist China wages it? How do we see it? Well, in many ways, it comes through our institutions, our corporate sector. For example, um, things like the CHIPS Act. You know, if it goes against China's interests, what they'll do is they'll go and talk to our corporations, U.S. corporations that are involved in that legislation, and then they come in and lobby the the Congress to change the legislation to create loopholes. So they are involved in our state and local governments by providing investments, building factories, for example, or buying land. They become then influential locally in the political process, and that. Um, you know, provides benefits for the Chinese Communist Party. They invest in our universities. Their students come and pay tuition. So they, they end up uh, influencing our academic institutions. And so across the board, uh, because we have a globalized world, because we're connected by the Internet, they're influencing our population. And they took the concept of active measures from the Soviet Union, and they combined them 
to really uh, put this capability of influence on our population on steroids. On the flip side, many people are like, oh, you know, what's so bad about a rising China? They're just trying to help their own people. We have this concept of private businesses versus the government. How does that work in China? Are there actually private businesses that are separate from the Chinese regime? It's all under an authoritarian regime. And everybody, this is what I don't understand. Everybody knows that dictatorships basically dictate to the population, no matter if you're a citizen or a company. And China is a dictatorship. And so if they want something, they get it, period, end of story. The fact that anybody would claim that any, any company in China is private is just not being, they're being intellectually dishonest. It almost sounds like we're playing by two different rule books in a way, right? The West sees China the way we see ourselves, whereas China's playing by their rule book. Given that, where's the middle ground? How do we proceed from here? Well, as I said yesterday in my testimony, the only way we save the republic is by cutting off access for China to our, um, to our economy, to our society, to our culture. I mean, we just have to cut them off. And we did that with the Soviet Union because, you know, Churchill came to America uh, in, in a town outside St. Louis and, and gave the Iron Curtain speech, and he had credibility, and people listened. China is no different than the Soviet Union. If we don't work together to isolate China, and that includes Russia and Iran and North Korea, which are essentially satellite states of this, of this new um, hedge money, then we're not going to be able to get out from under it because they have active measures that are you know, leveraging globalization, they're leveraging the internet, and it's far, far more dangerous than the Soviet Union ever was. General Spaulding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, J.P. Morgan's CEO Jamie Dimon sheds light on China in the wake of ongoing wars and conflicts. Here's what he said in an interview with Bloomberg aired Wednesday. Where's China on the list of risks? When I say geopolitical, that's the big one. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's the threat from Ukraine, oil and gas, food, migration, all our relationships, the most important one being China. That is the most important for the future of the world. Uh, and, and obviously Ukraine is affecting it. And in fact, it's very hard to see really positive outcomes with China until the Ukraine war is resolved. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon is openly opposing the de-risk strategy with China. In contrast, he wants more engagement between the U.S. and China. He added he'd like to see good American leadership engaging with Beijing. That's despite warnings from some senior U.S. officials. At the beginning of this year, the spy chiefs from the CIA, FBI and the White House all warned about China's threats to U.S. national security. CIA Chief William Burns called China a far bigger threat to the U.S. than Russia from the long-term perspective. In recent years, the Chinese Communist regime has been cracking down on private businesses running in China. The worsening economy and investment environment have driven away many foreign investments. But Beijing wants to increase direct engagements with U.S. tycoons. Worth noting, China has invited many executives from various sectors to travel to China. China said its gross domestic product grew by over 5 percent in the first quarter from a year ago. But did Chinese authorities get their math right? China's growth of exceeding expectations, look, that's a government figure. It can't be trusted. They set their targets. Uh, it's not like GDP is an output. GDP is an input. They have to work really hard to make that target and make the math work. And you can't trust that and, among other numbers. Some Chinese Internet users did their own math based on official data from this year and last year, and they came to a different conclusion. Their calculations show China's GDP growth in the first quarter is less than 4 percent, contrary to the over 5 percent growth posted by authorities. China's economy remains sluggish, and the real estate sector appears trapped in a downturn. Foreign investment into China was down almost 20 percent at the beginning of this year compared to last year. Switching gears to the technology sector, Chinese telecom giant Huawei has unveiled new phones containing a Chinese-made advanced semiconductor. This comes as Washington seeks to curtail the regime's chip-making capacity. Let's zoom in. Huawei started selling new, highly anticipated smartphones on Thursday. 
Two models from its high-end Pura 70 series were snapped up by customers in China. Analysts expect the device to contain an advanced China-made chip, similar to Huawei's Mate 60 handset which launched last year. The Mate 60 was celebrated by Chinese state media as a win over US sanctions on Huawei. Its advanced chip is seen as just a few generations behind cutting-edge semiconductors used by US giants like Apple and Google. The starting price for the Pura 70 series is around $760. Two separate versions, known as the Pro and Ultra, were out of stock at Huawei's online store just a minute after sales started. Hundreds of the brand's fans lined up at Huawei flagship stores across the country in Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen. The launch of the Mate 60 Pro last August led to a spike in Huawei smartphone sales and analysts say the trend looks set to continue. According to research firm CounterPoint, Huawei saw unit sales rise by 64% year-on-year over the first six weeks of 2024. Meanwhile, Apple's iPhone sales in China fell almost a quarter during the same period. In addition, Huawei's new semiconductors are considered a symbol of China's tech resurgence. The Biden administration began reviewing the company's new chips last month, saying its manufacturer might have breached U.S. export policies. Huawei was added to Washington's trade sanction list in 2019. Officials fear its products could pose national security threats. Chinese armed forces supplied with Western know-how. According to a report by the Dutch military intel agency MIVD, Beijing's espionage has been targeting the Netherlands' most critical industries, from cutting-edge semiconductors to aerospace and maritime manufacturing. The end goal is to build an armed forces equipped with foreign technologies. The Netherlands has previously reported cases of Chinese state-backed cyber attacks targeting its military network. MIVD says those efforts have only intensified over the last year. Worth noting, the Netherlands is the world's leader in chip making equipment. Taking the lead is that business is multinational corporation ASML, the world's only maker of advanced lithography machines capable of producing the world's most advanced chips. Last year, the Netherlands teamed up with the U.S. to keep certain manufacturing technology away from China. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for three years. If you'd like to support us, consider donating. Find us at donorbox.org slash China dash in dash focus or subscribe to our partner platform Epic TV where you can watch our full episodes. Just click the link down below. Here's what to look out for in our second half. A top advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci hit with a subpoena from Congress. His emails allegedly showing he evaded federal law. More on the details. Stars witnessing a clash between the world's top superpowers. Can the United States maintain its space supremacy or will communist China take over in the final frontier? Technology is still fundamentally better, but they are moving very quickly, partly because they acquire that technology from here. And unrest brewing in mainland China, stirring up a storm of discontent. A look at poignant scenes of elderly demonstrators crawling on the ground as they lament their financial losses. More on that after the break here on China in Focus. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.